If you clicked on this video not knowing what you're about to watch, let me give you a quick rundown. This is Killer Bites, a show where we talk about true crime cases while making something tasty in the kitchen. It seems a bit strange to combine those two elements, but we found the cooking lightens up the intensities of the crimes we cover, and it's satisfying to watch. Today on Killer Bites, I'm gonna tell you about Jacqueline de Wallaby's case while making Rice Krispie treats. You can find the recipe in the description below. Anytime a kid goes missing, detectives often focus on three main things theories, that the child ran away, was taken by a criminal, or offed by a friend or family member who tried to cover up the crime. When seven-year-old Jacqueline de Wallaby was reported as missing, the police leaned into the third theory. They thought Jacqueline's stepdad and mom were responsible, but the only real piece of evidence they had against them was a man with bipolar disorder who said he saw someone with a big nose in the middle of the night. Huh? On the morning of September 10th, 1988, David DeWallaby noticed the back door to his home was partially open. It was like 7.15 in the morning, and he and his son were the only ones awake. Neither of them had touched the door, so it was just kind of odd. At first, David thought maybe his mom, who lived in the basement, came home earlier and left the door open. But he looked outside, and her car wasn't in the driveway. So then he was all like, oh. Maybe she left in a rush and forgot to close the door. David's wife, Cynthia, woke up shortly after that. And sometime around 9 or 10 a.m., Cynthia went into the room of her seven-year-old daughter, Jacqueline. Cynthia walked in to wake Jacqueline up for the day, but she wasn't there. The DeWallaby family then searched their entire home for Jacqueline, and she was nowhere to be found. Trying to stay calm, Cynthia went through all of the logical possibilities. She thought Jacqueline may have gone to hang out with friends, so David and his son then went out to look for Jacqueline in all of her usual hangout spots, but had no luck. Cynthia then went back into her daughter's room to see if she could find any clues as to where she went. I'm gonna start by melting some butter. And that's when Cynthia realized something concerning. Jacqueline's comforter was missing. If she went outside to play with friends, she most definitely wouldn't have taken her comforter. Cynthia, still exhausting all possible options, walked over to her neighbor's house to ask if they knew anything about where Jacqueline was. On the way over, Cynthia saw the basement window to her home had been broken. Someone must have gotten in and abducted Jacqueline. At that point, Cynthia called the police to report her daughter missing. When officers arrived at the Dewallabies, they took down statements from the family members and looked around the home. They thought the broken basement window was the intruder's point of entry, but then David was like, oh yeah, I forgot to mention this, but the back door was left open this morning. And the cops were writing in their notebooks like, this stepdad seems sketchy. Well, it's not confirmed that they did that, but officers did suspect the parents may have known more than they let on about Jacqueline's disappearance. Now I'm gonna start adding my marshmallows. Over the next few days, everyone in Midlothian, Illinois was searching for the missing girl. The detectives were certain a ransom phone call would be made or a letter would be sent to the Dewallaby's home or the police station. A lot of times when kids are taken from their home like this, the perp sends a letter or makes a call to demand money for the child's safe return. But nothing like that ever came through on the phone or in the mail. And while detectives were taking the intruder theory seriously, they also had a second theory that the parents did it. The day after Jacqueline was reported missing, David agreed to take a polygraph test, which he passed. But something about the whole setup just didn't sit right with the investigators. There was more broken glass on the outside of the house than in the basement, which meant the window was probably broken from the inside. And the dust on the windowsill was undisturbed, as well as the nightstand, towel rack, TV tray, and makeup tray nearby. So detectives thought David or Cynthia may have busted the window on purpose to make it look like some intruder had gotten in that night. But why would someone want to do something like that? To stage your own child's abduction is pretty intense, and I don't understand the benefit to doing so. On September 14th, four days into the investigation, David was brought in for another polygraph test. This time, the results came back inconclusive. According to David, the interviewer told him to say yes to every single question. Even the question of, did you kill your daughter? Yo, even if a police officer told me to say yes to a question like that, I feel like I wouldn't be able to do it. And I also highly doubt that that's how it went down. Well, after the inconclusive polygraph test, 
David was interrogated for five hours. At the five hour mark, a detective came into the room and notified David that his stepdaughter's lifeless body had been found. He thought the detectives were messing with him to try and get a confession, but when he got home and saw his wife's face, he knew they were telling the truth. Jacqueline's corpse was discovered in a vacant field near Blue Island, Illinois, just six miles away from her home. At the scene, officials recovered Jacqueline's comforter, nightgown, and a rope that was around her neck. But in the autopsy, medical examiners weren't able to determine when Jacqueline was slain. So detectives went door to door asking those who lived by the vacant lot if they saw or heard anything suspicious. One man named Everett said he saw someone with a large straight nose pulling away from the dump site at 2 a.m. on September 10. Everett couldn't tell if the big nosed person was a man or a woman, but he thought they looked Caucasian and said they were driving a dark colored car. But his statement wasn't really that helpful because he was like, yeah, the, the car was dark blue or navy blue, or black, or maybe brown. Wait, how did he not know the color of the car but knew exactly what the perp's nose looked like? That's a bit sus. Anyway, Everett was brought down to the station and shown pictures of potential suspects to see if he could identify the type of nose he saw. He pointed to the picture of David DeWallaby. Throughout his interview, Everett changed up the description of the car quite a bit. He went back and forth between different sizes and colors until he all of a sudden said it was a 1979 Chevy Malibu. And guess what kind of car Cynthia drove? A Chevy Malibu. Also, David had a nose that matched Everett's description. Hmm. So maybe David was responsible for the crime and he transported Jacqueline's body in his wife's car? Well, Cynthia's car was thoroughly examined and officials weren't able to find any evidence to prove Jacqueline's corpse had been in there. Some articles say hairs from Jacqueline's head were found, but she had obviously ridden in the car many times and there was no way to determine when the hairs were left. What investigators were really trying to find was spatters of vital fluid, but they never did. Two other witnesses came forward saying they saw Cynthia's car near the empty lot where Jacqueline was found. But detectives confirmed Cynthia's car was parked at her house during the time of those two sightings. That didn't mean David and Cynthia were off the hook though. In fact, it wasn't long before they were arrested for the demise of their daughter with the belief that the window was broken from the inside. One day after the arrests were made, the forensic report came back with confusing results. It said the window was actually broken from the outside, not the inside as the police initially suspected. Oh. But the report also said the bigger shards of glass were placed on the ground outside of the house to minimize noise, which is probably why it looked like it was broken from the inside. And that also meant whoever broke it was pretty particular about the placement of everything, which still gave reason to believe Cynthia and David could have done it. So the couple was arrested on November 22nd of 1988. So now I'm gonna start adding my rice puffs. They remained in jail until friends and family members posted their bond. Cynthia was released on December 15th, and David was released one day later. On April 5th, 1990, Cynthia and David finally went to trial for the abduction and execution of seven-year-old Jacqueline. The prosecution brought Everett up to the stand to talk about how he saw someone with a nose like David's sitting in a car by the scene that night. But the defense pointed out that the car had to be at least 225 feet away, and Everett wouldn't be able to tell the shape of the driver's nose from that big of a distance, especially in the middle of the night. Defense attorneys also brought to the court's attention that the photos Everett was shown where he pointed David out were all taken from the front. You can't determine a nose shape like that without it being a profile view. David's photo was also bigger than the others, which defense attorneys claimed was a sort of optical illusion that urged Everett to pick it. Yeah, that's sketchy for sure. Then the topic of the window came up. While the analysis said it was broken from the outside, the prosecuting attorneys questioned that an intruder came in that way. They didn't think someone could break in through the window without knocking over or messing up anything underneath the windowsill, like the makeup tray and nightstand and stuff. But the defense proved it was possible because David recorded a video of his neighbor sneaking in through the window and they were able to get in without disturbing the scene. As shaky as the prosecution's case might seem to you at the moment, they still had a lot of other evidence to present. 
like a pillow that was found in Jacqueline's room with red stains, and a strand of hair that appeared to be from Jacqueline's head found in the trunk of Cynthia's car. As I mentioned earlier, the hair evidence wasn't strong enough to determine without a doubt that Jacqueline's corpse had been transported in Cynthia's car but the fact that the strands were in the trunk makes it seem likely. A few other sketchy elements highlighted by the prosecution include a claim from Jacqueline's brother, who said Jacqueline was spanked a lot by their parents, and a statement from the Dewalabi's neighbor, who said the rope found around Jacqueline's neck was one they'd seen her brother playing with in the past. The defense hit back by exposing the fact that the red stains on the pillow couldn't be identified, and the strands of hair were never officially confirmed as Jacqueline's. Their theory was that a convicted offender named Perry, who'd committed a similar crime one year after Jacqueline's, was the one responsible. It's not clear how in depth they went into this claim, but they apparently had enough reason to believe Perry was responsible if they threw out his name like that. Before the trial was over, the judge called the prosecution and defense attorneys to his chambers. He said there wasn't enough evidence against Cynthia, so he would be dismissing her charges. But that wasn't the same for David. After 14 hours of deliberation, the jury came to a consensus. On May 3rd, their verdict was announced. David was guilty. The judge sentenced David to 40 years for the homicide and five years for attempting to cover it up. This decision caused a huge uproar in the community. Some people were happy as they truly believed David was guilty. Others, like Cynthia, were enraged as they knew David didn't do it. To me, David definitely seems sketchy, but I don't think there was enough evidence to find him guilty. David's loved ones started a grassroots movement to try and get him out of jail, and that movement caught the attention of David Protus, a legal journalist for the Chicago Tribune. To avoid any confusion, we'll call this David by his last name. Protus. That July, Protus published a two-part series to break down the case and criticize the guilty verdict. After the articles were published, one of the jury members from the Dewalabi's trial reached out saying she regretted voting David as guilty, but did it because she felt pressured by the rest of the group. Yeah, it's crazy to think everyone came to that verdict, given the lack of hard evidence against David. Protus became heavily invested in the case and teamed up with Paul Hogan, a reporter from a Chicago news station, to dig a little deeper. After doing some sleuthing, the two men found out about an experiment conducted by Robert Clifford, who was the head of South Suburban Prosecutions for the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. Back when Everett first talked about seeing the perp's nose, Robert was skeptical. He asked his police chief buddy, Paul, to do an experiment with him. The two men staged the scene Everett described and concluded what the defense attorneys later presented. It was impossible for Everett to see the perp's nose from 225 feet away. But Robert wasn't in charge of the prosecution team for this case, so I guess he either never presented these results to the person who was in charge, or he did and they decided to keep them a secret. Something else questionable uncovered by Protus and Paul was that Everett, the witness, wanted to be a police officer, but was rejected because he had bipolar disorder. Those two elements could definitely affect his witness statement. Well, Paul decided to broadcast an interview with Everett, and Everett literally said on camera that the lead prosecutor on the case had a more prominent nose than David's. And he was all like, yeah, if the prosecutor's picture was in the lineup, I would have picked him. Wait, what if the crime was committed by the prosecutor who was now doing everything in his power to cover it up? I mean, that's very unlikely, and I think the point Everett was trying to make is that the other people in the pictures he was shown didn't have as big of noses, but still. As the conversations were going on in the media about David being innocent, they were also going on in the courthouse on the down low. On October 30th, 1991, the Illinois Appellate Court unanimously reversed David's conviction without the possibility of a retrial. This decision was made because there was basically the same amount of evidence against Cynthia and David. So if Cynthia was set free due to the lack of evidence, then the judge should have decided the same thing for David. On November 11th, David was set free from jail after serving 583 days in jail, counting the 24 days he spent after 
his initial arrest. 583 days. No other convictions have been made in Jacqueline's case, but a few other suspect names have been thrown around. You already know about Perry, the convicted offender the defense attorney pointed fingers at. But after the episode of Unsolved Mysteries that covered this case was released in late 1992, someone came forward with a new potential suspect. A paranoid schizophrenic man named Timothy Guess, who was the brother of Jacqueline's biological dad. So, Jacqueline's uncle. Timothy was interviewed at the beginning of the investigation, but told the police that he was at a restaurant all night when Jacqueline was abducted. Apparently two waitresses confirmed this, but then they later told Protus and Paul that Timothy was only at the restaurant for a little bit, around 9.30 p.m. They said the only reason they didn't correct their statement to the police was because they thought the Dewalabies were guilty and they didn't want to get involved. Uh. Who's gonna tell those waitresses that that's not how that works? By confirming Timothy's alibi, they already got involved. And just because you think someone else did it, that doesn't mean you have to lie to try and prove it. Protus and Paul allegedly talked to guests who were at the restaurant that night, and they never mentioned seeing Timothy. They were also never interviewed by the police. In December of 1992, Protus interviewed Timothy, who talked all about his mental health journey. Timothy confessed to hearing voices in his head, suffering from blackouts, and taking a bunch of substances. Since he was 16 years old, Timothy said he had a spirit guide who gave him psychic powers. This spirit allowed him to do things like describe the layout of David and Cynthia's home in detail without even stepping foot inside. Protus asked Timothy how he got into Jacqueline's room, and he literally said, I walked past Davy's room. That was the spirit talking, not me. I didn't say nothing, I just released information. Bro, believe it or not, you did just say something, and it was suspicious AF. After trying to blame all of his sketchy answers on his spirit, Timothy was all like, no, for real, I was at the restaurant. But Protus was like, dude, None of the guests saw you there. To that, Timothy replied, maybe I was invisible that day. The spirit can help me do that. I was there physically, but no one could notice me. I feel like Timothy had to have done it. For him to straight up talk about walking into Jacqueline's room is a pretty solid giveaway. And all of the evidence against everyone else was weak. Who do you think did it? David, Cynthia, Timothy, or someone else entirely? And if you think it was Timothy, was he possessed or was this his own doing? Well, my spirit is leading me to eat these Rice Krispies. So I'm gonna say goodbye for now. Thanks for watching everyone.